Hello and welcome to today's revision session on GCSE Physics Paper 1 for Separate Science. So in today's lesson we're going to try to answer examination questions on GCSE Physics Paper 1. So if we've been successful and learned in this revision session, we should be able to answer GCSE Physics examination style questions. We should be able to assess our understanding on GCSE Physics, then finally understand what topics we need to improve upon for GCSE Physics. So when you're preparing to carry out this revision session. You should, comp you should place your work in a piece of paper with two sections. Now make the section on the left hand side larger than the section on the right hand side. Now on the left hand side section, write down your working out and answers to the questions in the revision session. When doing this, make sure you write in full sentences and show your full working out. And in the right hand section on your piece of paper, write down any piece of information which you find useful or any hints and tips on answering the questions from the revision session. Now, uh, what you should then do is after the revision session finishes write up these notes into a revision session for you to use independently so let's have a look at some questions which could come up on GCSE separate science physics paper 1 so we'll look at our first topic which is energy so figure 12 gives information about the production of electricity in the United Kingdom in 2016 now the UK government signed the Paris climate agreement in April 2016 the agreement commits the UK to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere explain which energy resources in figure 12 should be used to meet the UK's commitment to the Paris Climate Agreement. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answers. Right, so when you're looking at this question, you need to ensure that you discuss the different energy resources indicated on this figure 12. If a question asks you in an examination to refer to a particular figure, such as a table or a graph, you must do that in your answer. So what you should be saying is that for nuclear, that there's no carbon dioxide released when generating electricity, so there's no greenhouse gases produced. Also, it is a reliable energy resource. It has a high energy density, so it means that there's, the more, there's more energy released uh, with uranium per kilogram. It's always important you mention the idea of per kilogram. Already that the power stations have been built for nuclear and therefore more power stations are also being built, which means that therefore the infrastructure is in place. Whilst for wind, okay, no carbon dioxide is released, so, so therefore there's no greenhouse gases released. There, there's a renewable energy resource and also there's no fuel costs once the actual air uh, wind turbine have been built. Now you should notice on this particular figure 12 there's also gas and coal but because they release greenhouse gases which is a fact you've got to be aware of you wouldn't have as an answer in your question. Right, next question. So on average, there's enough wind in the UK each year to supply all of the UK's electricity needs. Explain why the UK may still need power stations that use fuel to generate electricity. And then all European countries signed the Paris Climate Agreement in 2016. In the future, some European countries will allow will only allow electric vehicles. Suggest how this is likely to affect methods of electri electricity generation in these countries. So once again, pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, so again, you've got to think about okay, and the idea of the pros and cons of wind energy. Now, when you have your uh, physics exam, you need to make sure you know the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages of all the different energy resources that we use in this country. So for wind, what is the major issue with wind? That wind is unreliable to be unable to meet the demand when the wind speed is low. Okay, and they're all when there's no wind and you're unable to make the base load at all times, which means you can't use it for all of your electricity needs. You will need something as a reliable supply, which will always meet your energy demand. Now, in the next question, you've got to think about why, why electrical vehicles will affect electricity generation in these countries. So it's the idea that if you're only going to be using electrical vehicles, well, then the electrical generation will need to increase to meet the higher demand. So, but we need to keep maintaining the, our Paris Climate Agreement, which says that we can't be releasing CO2. So therefore, we've got to pick energy resources which do not release CO2. So you would say something such as nuclear, wind power, or another state renewable. Always remember when you answer a question to link it into that question asked. Next question. Explain two advantages of using undersea tidal turbines to generate electricity rather than burning fossil fuels. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so again, like mentioned before, 
you've got to think about the advantages and disadvantages of the different energy resources that you can find in the United Kingdom and in the world in general. Now you'll notice that it's four marks and the question says explain. So you won't just get marks for just stating an advantage, you will need to explain why it is an advantage. So let's look at a couple of the answers. Firstly, you could say that tidal energy is renewable. So the importance of this is that you won't run, it won't, you won't run out of the um, source unlike fossil fuels. Another advantage would be you don't emit carbon dioxide with tidal, so therefore it won't contribute to climate change. It doesn't emit any sulfur or nitrogen oxide, so therefore it will not contribute to acid rain, which is another advantage you can discuss. It doesn't use fossil fuels, so there's less impact on the environment in terms of extracting them out of the ground or under the, from under the sea. And it doesn't produce particulates, so there's less effect on the health and the environment. So again, it's very important you know the advantages and disadvantages advantages of every single energy resource and it can explain why that's an advantage and why it's a disadvantage. Let's look at the next question. A gas fire power station has a power output of 50 megawatts. Calculate the energy transfer during 24 hours. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so with this type of question, I note that it's four marks. So you've got to understand there will be some form of trick or issue with the question. So the first thing you're going to have to do is write out your equation. Now you need to memorize this particular equation, but you should be aware that energy is equal to power times by time. Now the next thing is you will check for your prefixes. Now if you look in the answer, you can see that we've got 50 megawatts. So straight away, you need to convert your megawatts into just watts. Now, mega means million or times 10 to the 6. So you've got to write energy out as 50 times 10 to the 6. And then the second thing is we look at the units. Now, watts is fine, but hours isn't because we don't work in hours in physics, we work in seconds. So you're going to have to convert uh, 24, in, 24 hours into seconds. So you do 24 times by 60 times by 60 because there are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. So we'll get an answer of 86,400. So once we've got our values uh, in the correct form, we then place it into our equation. So we then say uh, 50 uh, times 10 to the 6 times by 86,400 is equal to 4.32 times 10 to the 12, which you can just write out as a standard answer. And there you go with your response. Now, again, what you've also got to do with your answers is check that this looks right. Now, again, 4.32 times 10 to the 12 is a very large number, but it's how much an entire power station produces in 24 hours. So it is probably going to be right. So you can see if you just check your answer, you can make sure you've got you in the right ballparks you've probably done your calculation right. So now let's look at the topic of electricity. So let's look at our first question. A student investigated how the resistance of a piece of nichrome wire varies with length. And figure three shows part of the circuit that the student used. So describe how the student will obtain the data needed for the investigation, including a risk assessment for one hazard in the investigation. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so let's have a look at answering the following question. So, what would you do here? So it's six marks and you've got to write out a method. So what you're going to have to do is identify what your dependent and independent variables are, which is always important for every investigation. So in this investigation, you would note that the uh, length is going to be the dependent variable, sorry, the independent variable, as that is the thing you are changing, the length of the actual wire, whilst you've got your dependent variable, the thing which you measure, which is the current and the potential difference. Now you'll note in your diagram that you could use an ohm meter to work out the resistance, however, However, that's not going to be the case we're going to look at because we're going to work out resistance from the equation potential difference over current. So you'll measure your potential difference, you'll measure your current, and then you'll use that to work out resistance by doing resistance is equal to potential difference over current. At this point, you will also state what you how you will vary something so you'll say you'll vary the length and what you're going to do to measure that length so you say you would use a ruler to measure those different lengths it's always important you state your measuring devices for your independent and dependent variables in any method the next thing you're going to have to state is that you would do some repeats because you'll always carry out repeats because repeats reduce random error you then plot the graph of resistance against length and then as a result you can work out the relationship between them now the next thing is the question 
question asks you, ask you about a hazard. Now, a hazard is something which could cause an injury in the investigation. So you uh, maybe a high current, which could cause the wire to melt or overheat, which could then cause burns to the skin. Now, how could you reduce that risk? You could either use a low current or turn off the device when you're not using it. Now, again, it's very important you clearly lay, lay out your steps to your method, stating bit by bit, step by step, how you work out these values. Right, so let's have a look at another question. Right, th this graph shows how the electrical current uh, through a 12 volt filament lamp uh, varies with the potential difference across the bulb. So explain why the resistance of the metal filament inside the bulb changes as the potential difference across the bulb increases. So once again, pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right. So, you've got to think to yourself what's actually going on in terms of the graph. So the first thing you note is that when you increase the potential difference, the current in the filament increases, which is the first statement. Now the next thing you're going to have to think about is what is the resistance in an electrical wire? Well, the resistance is caused by the collision of the electrons, the charge carriers in the wires, with the actual atoms or ions of that wire. So the point is that if you have a greater potential difference, difference going through the filament well at this point there's more energy in the metal in the metal ions or atoms of the wire so this will cause the ions of the atoms of the metal to vibrate further so therefore you'll increase the number of collisions and that will therefore increase the temperature of the metal wire which is what's going on here and you can tell that the temperature is is changing because the line is curving indicating that the resistance has got higher Right, next question. A student investigated how the resistance of a thermistor varies with temperature. So the student made measurements uh, to determine the resistance of the thermistor at room temperature. He used an ammeter and a voltmeter. Complete the circuit diagram to show a circuit the student could use. So once again, pause the video, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so let's have a think about what we need in our circuit diagram. Now, it's important that for your GCSE physics examination, you know what the different circuit symbols are in in a in particular circuit, so you need to know all of them and state in the specification. So what do we need in this particular um, circuit? Well, we will need a thermistor, and we'll need to have an ammeter and voltmeter because they're stated in the question. The next thing you've got to remember is where you place your ammeter and voltmeter in a circuit. Now, ammeters are always placed placed in series as they measure current flow, whilst the voltmeter, which measures potential difference across a device, is placed in parallel with that device. But remember, it's always placed in parallel with the device being, me the device being measured, not just anywhere in the circuit. So you would have your correct symbols for your thermistor, your voltmeter and your ammeter, whilst you have your voltmeter in parallel and your battery in series with the thermistor and the ammeter, as shown. Let's have a look at the following question. The student repeated the measurements with a thermistor at different temperatures. He plotted a graph of resistance against temperature. Figure 6 shows the graph. For one set of readings was potential difference equals 5.60 volts and current equals 0.04 amps. Determine the temperature of the thermistor. Then explain how the graph shows that the thermistor is most sensitive to changes in temperatures between 20 degrees Celsius and 25 degrees Celsius. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so the first thing to note is you should remember what you can work out with potential difference in current. So you've got to memorize that resistance is equal to potential difference divided by current. Now that allows you to work out a resistance and you'll notice you've been given a graph which has the resistance on one axis and the temperature on another. So you can then work out what your what your temperature is going to be by looking across on your graph. So if we take these values out here, you can see that you can work out the resistance by doing 5.60 over 0.04, which is equal to 140 ohms. You then read across and it comes out to 40 degrees Celsius on your graph. Now, how can the graph show that the thermistor is most sensitive to changes in temperatures between 20 to 25 degrees Celsius? Well, you can see that on the graph because the gradient is the steepest. Now, the 
gradient is a measure of the rate of change in your graph. So if the gradient is the steepest, that tells you get your biggest change of resistance for the same temperature. Now, if you are given a graph or table in a question in physics, you've got to make sure that you use it so you can work out your answer and refer to it in your actual answer. Right, next question. Energy is supplied to the electrical motor by a battery. The battery is charged using a charger. When the charger is connected to the battery, the potential difference across the battery is 15 volts. The total energy stored when the battery is fully charged is 0.81 megajoules. The average current used to charge the battery is 3 amps. Calculate the time taken to fully charge the battery. So pause the video again, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so it's a six mark question. So the first thing I note is I will probably need at least two equations to work out my answer. Now the next thing is I scan my, my values and I look to the fact that I've got an answer in megajoules. So that isn't going to work and you need to convert that value of megajoules into joules. So you will convert that to 0.81 times 10 to the 6 because mega means a million or times 10 to the 6. The next thing is you look to see you've got energy, you've got potential difference, and you've got current given in the question, and you need to work out time. So the first thing that pops into my head is that you can work out what the power is by doing power is equal potential difference times by current, which is why it's so, so, so important that you always memorize your equations. So from that point, you can work out what your power is by doing 15 times by 3, which is equal to 45 watts. You can then say your energy energy is then 0.81 times 10 to the 6 or 810,000 joules. We can then use the equation energy is equal to power times by time to then say time is therefore equal to energy over power. So therefore we can therefore say time is going to equal to 810,000 over 45 so our answer is 18,000 seconds. Now again the last thing that we do is check to see if our answer looks correct and if it does look correct it probably will be so as a result we can work out our we can deduce our answer is correct. Next question, next topic is going to be on the particle model of matter. So in this question, it says figure 16 shows a wind turbine. At a particular wind speed, a volume of 2.3 times 10 to the 4 meters cubed of air passes the blades each second. The density of air is 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. Calculate the mass of air passing through the blades per second. Then the power output of the turbine is directly proportional to the kinetic energy of the air passing the blade each second. So describe the effect on the power output when the wind speed is halved. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, now it's very, very important you learn the equation for density. So density is going to equal to mass over volume. Now you'll see what AQA like people to do in their answers is actually write out the equation first, then sub the answers directly into that equation. So we can say that the density, which is equal to 1.2, is equal to mass over 2.3 times 10 to the 4. We rearrange that and make mass the subject, so we get out to, uh, 2.76 times 10 to the 4 or 27,600 uh, kilograms and there's our answer for that question. Now the next one you've got to think about what's the equation for kinetic energy. Now kinetic energy is a half mv squared so that tells you that if the that the mass of air passing through the turbine is halved, so therefore if you've got half of m there, the kinetic energy has gone down by a factor of two, it is halved, whilst the velocity has gone down, so it's also halved. But because it's v squared, that means that because it's halved, uh, v's halved, that the actual term in the kinetic energy will go down by a factor of four. So therefore you've gone down by a factor of four and a factor of two for mass and velocity, so overall the kinetic energy has decreased by a factor of 8. In the next topic now we're going to look at some questions on atomic structure. So in our first question it says alpha, beta and gamma are types of nuclear radiation. Explain why gamma emission does not change the atomic number of an element. Pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so gamma emission doesn't change the atomic number of an element because gamma emission does not change the number of protons, which is the atomic number, because gamma emission is an electromagnetic wave, not a particle. It's very important you know the properties of alpha, beta and gamma radiation, including what they're made from. In this next question, it says, explain why irradiating food makes it safer to eat. 
Food is packaged and then irradiated. Explain why food is irradiated using gamma radiation rather than alpha or beta. Then some people are concerned that irradiating food could be radio irradiated food could be radioactive. Describe how irradiated food is different from food that is radioactive. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so it's important that you know the difference between irradiation and contamination. So irradiation is when the radiation, the ionizing radiation, sorry, passes through the object. So this will prevent food poisoning because it will kill the bacteria or microorganisms on the substance, so produce, which produce toxins which could lead to illness. Now the next thing is explain why food is irradiated using gamma rather than alpha or beta. Well remember, irradiation is when ionizing radiation passes through an object. Now gamma rays can pass all the way through the packaging and get through all the food as opposed to alpha or beta which will be stopped by either air or the packaging of the food. And finally uh, people are worried that irradiated food could be radioactive. Describe how irradiated food is different from food that is radioactive. Now it's important you know whether contamination or irradiation can cause um, an object to become radioactive. Now if you are irradiated you do not become radioactive because if you are radioactive you must contain your own source of radiation whilst being irradiated only exposes you to ionizing radiation not that you're producing your own next question the half-life of carbon 14 is 5730 years carbon 14 is used for carbon dating carbon dating can tell us how old some objects are a skeleton is car was carbon dated uh, the results show that there were only 12.5% of the original amount of carbon-14 left in the skeleton. Calculate the age of the skeleton. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. So, how would you answer this question? So, what you would do is, at this point, you need to work out how much is left when there is only 12, how long has happened for it to get to 12.5%. So what you would do is you start off with 100%. You then half it to get to 50. You then half it again to get to 25. You then half it again to get to 12.5. At this point, you work out how many times you've halved it because each one is a half-life. So 100 to 50 is one. 50 to 25 is two. 25 to 12.5 is three. So therefore, there have been three half-lives. Now, each half-life is 5,700. 30 years old is those old so as should you multiply it by three and you get 17,190 years next question carbon 14 is a radioactive isotope with a half-life of 5730 years so a sample from a fossilized tree gives a count rate of 20 decays per second and the tree died 17,190 years ago determine what the count rate of the isotope was when the tree died so pause the video again then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer Right, so how do you answer this question? Well, the first thing to do is work out how many half-lives there have been. So if it happened 17,190 years ago, and each half-life is 5,730 years, okay, therefore there must have been three half-lives, because you divide one by the other. Then at this point, you go backwards, and therefore you don't half it, we double it. So we go from 20 and double it to 40. We go from 40, we double it to 80. Then from 80, we double it, and it goes to 160, which is what the answer is. Next question. Figure 10 shows how the count rate detected from the radiation source in the smoke alarm changes with time. The smoke alarm switches on when the count rate falls to 80 counts per second. Explain why the radiation source inside the smoke alarm should have a long half-life. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how do you answer this particular question? Well, you've got to work out how long it takes uh, to fall to 80 counts. So when it falls to 80 counts, you can see on the graph by referring to it, it takes one and a half, half uh, sorry, 1.3 half-lives to go to that point. So therefore, this means that the count rate would therefore be approximately constant if you had a long half-life, so it wouldn't go below that value as quickly, so therefore the smoke alarm wouldn't go off. Once again, you've got to refer to the actual data in the question to get your response. Next question. 
Uh, what is the difference between isotopes of the same element? An isotope of polonium is represented as such, and polonium-210 emits alpha radiation. Alpha particles can be represented by the symbol 4,2 for helium. An alpha particle consists of subatomic particles. What are these subatomic particles? Then complete the nuclear equation to show the radioactive decay of polonium-210 and use a periodic table to help you. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, so the first thing is just a fact you've got to learn. Different isotopes have the, a different number of neutrons, but the same number of protons. Now, what is an alpha particle? Again, you've got to be aware of what they are. So there's two protons and two neutrons. So you've got to just know what those values are. Then finally, if you have a decay equation, what you've got to be aware of is the idea that the number at the top has to be the same before and after, and the number at the bottom has to be the same before and after. So if we know that it has to be 210 before, what well has to be 210 after, and the alpha is given 4 at the heat of the helium nucleus there, the alpha is given 4, so the number at the top must be 206, and the number at the bottom must be 82, because 82 plus 2 equals 84, and then you can look on your periodic table, work out which element has 82 protons, which is the bottom number, and it is lead PB. Let's have a look at the next question. A sample of polonium-210 decays. Figure 3 shows how the percentage of polonium-210 nuclei remain and varies with time. Determine the half-life of the polonium. So pause the video now, then unpause the video to go through the answer. Right, so what would you do here? So again, it starts off at 100, so after one half-life, it has gone from 100 to half of 100, which is 50. So you go along to 50 on your um, y-axis, you then go along on your graph and extrapolate it down and work out your answer. So you'll see that if you go along to 50 and then go down from that line, it comes out to 138 days, because the half-life is the time it takes for the number of radioactive nuclei or the count rate or the activity to half. Next question. Another isotope of polonium, polonium-206, has a half-life of 8.8 .8 days. A 5 milligram sample of polonium-206 was left to decay. Calculate what mass of polonium remained after 44 days. And if polonium were to enter the body, the alpha and radiation emits would cause harm. Explain why alpha radiation emitted inside the body is harmful. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how can you work out what the mass of the polonium is after 44 days? Well, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to work out how many half-lives have taken place. So in 44 days, okay, there have been five half-lives because we know 44 divided by 8.8 .8 is equal to five. Then what you would do is now you know it halves five times because there are five half-lives and the half-life is the time it takes to half. You take your number, which is what you started with, which was five milligrams, and you half it. So you go 5 and divided by 2 is 2.5, then 2.5 divided by 2, then that value divided by 2, then that value divided by 2, then that value divided by 2, which equals 0.15625. Now the next question is, what, why can alpha radiation emitted inside the body be harmful? Now once again, you've got to be aware of the properties of alpha radiation. Alpha radiation is highly ionizing, so therefore it can be absorbed by cells and it can ionize um, the DNA in the cells. Now why is that an issue? And you've got to say why that is an issue for a human. Well that can cause mutations which can lead to cell death or cancer. Next question. Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope of carbon. Carbon-14 undergoes beta decay, and figure 3 shows an incomplete equation for the radioactive decay of carbon-14. What is what, Which of the following correctly completes the nuclear equation in figure 13? Then explain the change in the atomic number in the nuclear equation shown in figure 13. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. So, how would you answer this question? Well, again, it's important to note that the number at the top must be the same before and after. So, therefore, if it's 14 before, it must be 14 after. Now, you'll notice the nitrogen already present is given 14, so, therefore, the beta particle in the beta decay must have 0 as a top number. Now, you'll notice that if it's 6 before on the bottom, it must be 6 after on the bottom. So, it's the nitrogen is providing 7. So, what do you add to 7 to get to 6? You add minus 1, so the answer is 0 minus 1. Now explain what's going on in this nuclear equation. How can you get a minus one value when the bottom number is supposed to be the number of protons? 
Well, you've got to be aware of what beta decay actually is. Beta decay is the process of a neutron turning into a proton and an electron, a beta particle in this case. The beta particle gets expelled, whilst the proton stays in the nucleus. Now, for our numbers to balance on the bottom, because our our element left behind, our nucleus, has an extra proton, it's gone from 6 to 7, to make sure that number's balanced, the other number has to be minus 1, because 7 minus 1 equals 6. So that brings us to the end of this revision session. So if you've been successful and learned in this revision session, you should be able to answer GCSE physics examination style questions, you should be able to assess your understanding on GCSE physics, and then understand what topics you need to improve upon for GCSE physics. So thank you very very much for watching this revision session on GCSE Separate Science Paper 1. Thank you very much and as always have a lovely day.